So when you're a woman who's financially independent, this is what happens. It shouldn't be my body, my choice. That slogan is disgraceful. She can use that as a weapon. I completely understand the logic behind arranged marriages. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the podcast in partnership with Najahi Events. Relationships seem to be a struggle for so many people. Maybe you have had challenges in your marriage or your relationship. Do we really know what men want? Do we really know what women want? And can we avoid so many marriages ending in divorce? The questions that you need to ask to find out what's going wrong in your relationship and how you can fix it are going to be helped today by Sadia Khan, a relationship psychologist and someone that really has got a finger on the pulse of understanding relationships and what we can all do to live a better, more harmonious life with our partners. And lastly, thank you to Najahi Events, who have been sponsoring us now on the podcast for over a year. Najahi bring motivational speakers to the region to help inspire, educate and motivate you to achieve better success and live a better life. Sadia, thank you so much for coming to join us. No, thank you. It's good to have you on the show today. It's great to be here. We talked about you coming on the podcast for a while. We did. And then we ran into each other at an event and we were like, oh my God, we're supposed to do a podcast together. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I spoke to you beforehand. We spoke beforehand, and then we ran into each other at an event. We were like, oh, my God, let's do a podcast. But we, you didn't know anything about me, and I didn't know anything about you, but we know we wanted to join forces. Okay, that's right. Yeah. I remember it as well as I do. Yeah. Okay, so for the benefit of everybody that watches and listens to this, yeah. what do you do? I'm a psychologist, but I am, used to be a psychology teacher. Now I do more therapy and online coaching for mainly couples, but it's, my background is actually trauma. I did psychotherapy and I focused on trauma, but people online want to hear about relationships. So I end up talking a lot about relationships in the modern world. So if you go back to my grandparents and great grandparents, you know, yeah. marriage was for life. Oh. And that's what people did until death us do part and through better or for worse meant that people would work through their troubles and divorce wasn't something that was spoken about. Yeah. So much so that in 1977, when my parents got divorced, mm -hmm. I was the only person. Oh, wow. In my school, the only person so in my community, you? seven. Seven years old. Um, I was the only person that had that had parents that had divorced. Oh, and how was that? Well, it was, I didn't know any different apart. There was obviously a stigma attached to it, mm -hmm. but um, I'm seven years old. What do you do? Yeah. And I'm sure there's some, if you don't know, dig into trauma around that kind of time, saw some issues that happened because of it. But divorce then then became more and more mainstream and more accepted. And nowadays, I think, is it 50% of Yeah, I think it's divorce? higher than that. It's getting higher than that, but it's around 50%. So, well, it's interesting because you're, you're, you're from the UK like I am, but your heritage is Pakistani. Yeah, yeah fully Pakistani. So if you take that, that kind of like stereotypical understanding of a, a marriage in India and Pakistan, it's arranged marriages. Yeah. So your yeah. parents decide... Or our parents encourage you to be with mm -hmm. people that they see de uh, deemed fit. Yeah. Yeah. An ideal match. The ideal match. That's yeah. it. And there's been that TV show on Netflix as well, yeah. which is quite hilarious to watch. Have <laughs> you been watching it? I've watched some of the episodes. Yeah. yeah. It's quite funny to yeah. see this. Because in, in the UK, an arranged marriage to us makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, yeah. But when you really try and understand it, there's, there's some logic behind it. Totally. And, uh, you know, cohabiting couples have the highest rates of divorce and arranged marriages have the lowest rates of divorce. And it's something I'm starting to understand more and more, especially now with this profession. I completely understand the logic behind arranged marriages because when we're left to our own devices, we just choose whoever we like. And, uh, you know, you could like someone who might be bad for you, you might like someone who's completely different to you, whatever it is. But when families choose, they su choose families that are similar to them. And the reason why that's so productive is because chances are you have a similar set of morals, values and upbringing in childhood as well. So what happens is you kind of your childhood predicts your relationships a lot more than we realize. So when two families who are similar, their children tend to be compatible. Whereas two families that are totally different cultures, morals, and like prescriptive behavior, their children are not going to understand each other when the push comes to shove. So what ends up happening is cult people that come from similar backgrounds last longer. So it actually makes a lot of sense. Now that I'm older, I can see the logic behind it. Like if you chose somebody for your kids, you'll choose somebody who's probably parents are similar to you similar kind of education, all that. And then by by design, the children are more compatible. 
Okay, well, I've got some good examples of this in, in my own life. So my, my first marriage was to somebody who we we lasted for, I think, five years, got, yeah. had two kids and got divorced. And I look back on her family now and I think they're all nutcases. Yeah. You know, like, I really do. It makes a big uh, difference, right? Uh, and I, I'm glad I'm not part of that. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm married to somebody else now, Anna, and Anna's parents. Again, we're from completely different worlds, but her parents I really respect. I like being around them. They're very um, courteous. Yes, they're yeah. kind, they're, they're respectful. Yeah. And so in return, I'm all of those things towards them as well. And so it feels much better yeah. being around them. And I think this is something men really underestimate when they're picking a partner. They look for whoever they like and they think that they can change a woman. And they think if they treat a woman well, if you court her correctly, she's all yours. But I always say your competition is her childhood. If she had a chaotic childhood, you can give her and offer her the most stability there is to be found, but she will reject it. She will seek chaos and she will uh, glorify um, chemistry. Whereas if you choose somebody who's had a stable upbringing, lots of love, when you give her love, she reciprocates it. But when you give it to somebody who's come from a broken home and a broken background, when you give her love, she then sabotages it. So men are giving love recklessly. Women are giving love recklessly, thinking that they can change this person. But this is why arranged marriages, there was that common understanding. Like, I remember my parents saying things like, oh, you know, their family is a bit like dodgy. Don't go near them. And this family is good. And this, and at the time thinking that's so judgmental, but there's actually psychological uh, validity to what they were saying. Wow. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Well, it's not, it makes a whole load of sense the way you've just explained it. For me, for me, I would have never thought that. Okay, so, so, but what happens nowadays? You know, people meet others. There's all these different ways of meeting. You know, well, when I was when I was in my late teens, mm-hmm. I'd I'd be looking at a girl like you in a bar for three or four hours and try and summon the courage up to come and say hello, how are you, and get your number and stuff. And that required a lot of you know a, a lot of uh, bravery because yeah. you had to deal with rejection and stuff like that. Nowadays, obviously, it's different because it's all on apps and stuff like that, which we'll go into. Yeah. But people seem to fall in love with people that aren't necessarily the right people for them very quickly. That whole kind of like honeymoon phase happens, you know, Mm -hmm. we're we're in, you know, the three months dating and before they know it, they're telling each other they love each other and they want to live together and stuff. To me, when I look back on all my relationships, it's like, you know nothing about that person for the first year and a half, two years, really. Yeah. And you know, no, no, it's not so much knowing about them if you don't know how you're going to truly be around them yourself as well. Because they that... bring out pe- sides of you. They bring out different sides of you, people mm. are doing, yeah. And so there's this this kind of like this false narrative that exists in the early parts of a relationship mm. that needs to be worked through before you can truly be yeah. a couple. Mm-hmm. With that said and done, do you think that, that people are aware of that? I just think they just still go into relationships, you know, willfully naive and romanticizing everything before. I think the rise of romanticism has left, left to the death of marriage because what's happening is people are so attuned to what they want and their desires and not their outcomes in life. Now, if you want to get married and settle down, the person who might, you might want, who's like the hottest girl in the room or the most exciting guy, the first, he might be what you want and that might meet your current desires and you might find, fall, find in love, fall in love instantly. But somebody you need for a long-term marriage might be somebody more settled, calm and stable. So what's happening is because we're being told that that feeling, that chemistry is what you should go by, that gut feeling is so, so special, you should follow that instinct, we are being led in the wrong direction because that instinct contains all our desires. That could be like a desire to have drugs, it could be food, whatever. We're supposed to actually forego those feelings for the sake of our long-term goals. And if that person that gives you all those butterflies but isn't good for you, we should be avoiding that. But romanticism has taught you that that feeling suggests it's love and it's special and you should work with that person. And really it's counterproductive to long-term goals. So that's why marriage is falling apart. What do women look for and what do men look for? And has it always been the same or has that evolved? We look for a reincarnation of our childhood. Okay. What does that mean? So if you were given um, consistent care, love, unconditional, all that good stuff as a child, which very few people get, but if you do get it, if you're lucky enough to come out of childhood unscathed, then you'll look for stable, caring, consistent, monotony, and you'll meet those people who just met somebody in high school, got married, and now they're still together. They just walk their dog on the weekends. Very calm life. And there's other people who grew up with chaos, abuse, neglect, 
trauma, something like that. And so what they'll look for is somebody who can reincarnate those feelings and they don't realize it. So they find themselves in one toxic relationship after the other saying, this person was bad, that person was bad, not realizing that they attach to that toxicity because of how they've been programmed to think love is defined by chaos. Okay, well, this is going to challenge you then a bit, or maybe me. So, mm -hmm. so I have two daughters. Mm -hmm. They both come from a broken home like I do mm -hmm. because they're my daughters and I got divorced. <laughs> um, one of them, when she was 17, started dating a boy. She's mm -hmm. 23 years old now. They're still dating six and a half years later. Yeah. Very happy, very settled, planning their future together. Amazing. The other one is three years younger, so she's 20, nearly 21. And the thought of a relationship to her is just like, what a nightmare, what a headache. You know, it's about having fun, enjoying herself, yeah. you know, you know, drinking, smoking, partying, whatever it might be. And what looking at her sister who settled down, she's like, why would you want to do that? You yeah, know, that, 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 sounds like, that sounds really boring. Yeah. But you've got two kids that have both come from the same environment. Mm -hmm. Well, two parents don't, two kids don't always get the same parents because their birth order has an impact. Their natural sensitivity has an impact. So that's why you'll get two kids from an alcoholic and one will be an alcoholic and one will never touch alcohol because two children are not raised by two the same parents, even though they have the same parents. Where you are in your marriage, where you are financially changes and the reaction they get from the, uh, from the child because of their own nature also changes. But I would say usually when people have gone through a broken home environment, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it because I'm sure you gave them lots of unconditional love throughout it. But it can lead to two responses. One is where they become hyper clingy to whoever they love because they've seen it get break it down. So what happens is who they fall in love with, they could almost like live in that person's skin. They love them, they stick to them and they work through even things that they shouldn't work through. They want to work through it because of that fear of abandonment. Now, that fear of abandonment in another child can lead to complete independence. I think my fear of abandonment is going to be manifested by being completely autonomous, not needing a relationship, keeping relationships at arm's length. So you're, they both might have a level of abandonment in them, not because you did anything wrong, but just the, watching what a divorce looks like. It's uh, children learn relationships end. So in that process, they either become hyper-attached or hyper-independent. And both of them are semi-trauma responses. Okay, so I'm going to take a little bit from what you said and just give myself a little pat on the back there yeah. for a minute because I think, sarcastically, I do. Yeah. I think my eldest yeah. is the one that's in the relationship. Yeah. My eldest is a lot like me. Mm -hmm. My youngest is a lot like my my ex-wife. Right. And so if my eldest has found that way of, you know, looking for the calm, yeah. that's because of my wonderful parenting <laughs> skills and that's just connected to me and so she's... Uh -huh. <laughs> But now you're quite calm in relationships and you're stable. And Wow, that's a really, it's a really deep question uh, yeah. because the answer that I would give you versus the answer everybody else would give you yeah. might not be the same. Right. Um, from the lens of a partner? No. Right, from the lens of you? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what are no. you talking about? <laughs> I, think, I think that, I think that. I think I want things to be calm. Yeah, you're craving okay? calm. And I, and, and, and I don't want things to be uh, I'm not needy, no. so I'm fiercely independent, and and my wife Anna is fiercely independent as well, oh, wow. and that works for me, because that that neediness doesn't doesn't make me feel comfortable, um, but also I'm I'm there isn't a romantic bone in my body. Okay, so you you have that avoidant kind of independent trauma response, where you love space, you love independence, you could live separately, wouldn't bother you. Um, you are quite guarded emotionally, so your partner might sometimes wonder what you're thinking or feeling. And uh, you love, you love that person. You want to be with somebody, but you don't want to be emotionally intimate all day, every day. So you like them in the house, but you don't want to be talking all day, every day. And yeah. Yeah, do you think, does that sound a bit familiar? Yeah, really yeah. familiar. And then what will happen is sometimes your partner's question if you love them or not, because you're so strong with or without them. You do love them, but your love is... A, an avoidant style where it's like I love you but I'm going to do my life and if you want to come along you're most welcome but I'm not going to change everything just for a relationship it doesn't work like that for avoidance does that sound familiar it sounds spot on and yeah. I think that a lot of that comes from going through a divorce the first time I think that plays a part in in realizing that you don't want to attach yourself to somebody forever only yeah. to feel pain from that experience it's very painful yeah mm. it, to me it was like death even though yeah. worse than grief I always say because people kind of normalize the divorce but with grief there's a level of acceptance that this didn't work and it's out of your hands but with divorce it leaves people absolutely traumatized 
And I think because it's so common and people forget, and even when your friend's getting a divorce, it's just like, oh, that's a shame. But people don't realize that person's going through trauma. Okay. Well, there's that aspect, plus the aspect of you know, my, my parents got divorced when I was seven and my dad left. Oh, okay. So was it just a divorce? So my dad, my parents got divorced. My, my dad, as in, left the country, went to live in another country. Right. Um, that, With another it, family? or just... So he started another family since, but he went to live in another country and working overseas. And so my dad was my hero. Mm. And then all of a sudden he's not there. And so I felt abandoned. Absolutely. And I don't think I ever got over that feeling mm. of being abandoned. So, so I find it very hard to abandon. Yeah, you find it, but the thing is with people with your response, they they don't let go of a relationship, but even so because they don't want to abandon anyone, but they emotionally abandon. That's their way of protecting themselves. So they'll be there, but emotionally they won't be as intimate as a partner would like. And uh, somehow they'll always kind of not they'll never cheat or anything, not necessarily cheat, but they'll keep their eyes open. They can be a bit critical of their partners. It's their way of creating emotional distance. So even after intimacy, even after sexual intimacy, they might go jump on their laptop and do some work. Or they might go on their phone. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Suck for luck. <laughs> yeah, not that's, at all. Not at all. That's, uh, that's, wow, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, their, that's uh, the avoidant methodology of maintaining relationships, but there's an emotional distance to prevent the pain of abandonment. So, mm. they, so the partner is always left confused. Does this person even like me? But only when the partner threatens to leave, then they're like, no, I love you, like grand gestures. But when they come back, they're like, it's, it's as if business as usual. Wow. Yeah. That's an, a trauma response. You, yeah. You've, 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 that's a perfect description. It's a very common response. A lot of men have this and don't realize it. And their partners think, oh, they're narcissists, not narcissistic. It's a trauma response because you don't want, you don't not care about your partner. It's, this is how you love from a distance. Because it's painful loving so intimately and then they leave. Mm. So, it's, so you're operating from a place of fear, but it doesn't look like that because you look so strong and independent. But you're operating it out of a fear of abandonment. And usually you attract clingy um, partners because to the, for some reason the clingy people love the avoidant people because the avoidant people reinforce their view that they're not loved correctly and nobody loves them correctly. God. Yeah, isn't it so so mm. draining? So that's why it's good that you've got a partner that's independent because you'll probably understand it and not take it personal. Let's talk about some of the work that you do. So you took, you work with men whose wives cheat on them. A lot. Okay. Everybody's wife's cheating these days. Okay. <laughs> it's so bad. Goodness me. Wives need to, yeah, they're, they're all cheating at the moment. Maybe it's the ones that I deal with. Okay, so obviously there's going to be people watching. That's obviously not all. I do apologize. I do apologize. I'm talking about just a clientele. I've got a very uh, skewed vision of relationships because I attract and I work with those that are suffering. But there'll also be people listening right now in a car with their partner. Yeah, yeah, yeah your wife's cheating, guys. <laughs> <laughs> if you think she's cheating, she's cheating. No, I'm joking. Oh, oh God forbid. <laughs> so give, give, give me examples of, 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 I mean, stereotypically, historically, um, we have been told time and time and time again by society that men cheat, women aren't the cheaters, men are the ones that cause the problem. I always ask myself the question, if men are cheating and women don't cheat, then who are the men cheating yeah. with? You know, there's gonna there's gonna be you know there's two it takes two to tango. But anyway, mm -hmm. why why what are the reasons that you've learned that women cheat and are they similar to why men cheat? Mm -hmm. Or and and in terms of scale, mm -hmm. is it as many women cheating as men or are the is the data telling us something else? I think what has happened is because society's conditioned us to tell us that men cheat and women don't. Men don't look for the red flags. With women, you come home late a few times and she's already suspicious. You don't reply to her text, she's already suspicious because we've been conditioned to think that's a, a red flag. Men aren't uh, trained to think women cheat. They think women are loyal, loving, and, you know, if anything, they're the one that's going to cheat. So they're not trained to look for the red flag. And what I say with women who are genuinely most likely to cheat, usually it comes from her background. If she grew up without a stable, loving father figure, what happens is one partner is, children are designed to be loved by two people. It's just how they're designed. You know, you've got children, they need you, they need their mom, they need two people. And you know from your own experience that you need a dad as well. Now, what happens when you are in a relationship is that person kind of becomes your everything. And when they sense a fear of abandonment, any abandonment that their partner might be some spending too much time at work, might be taking long to reply, whatever it is, 
that woman who grew up with that fear of abandonment now thinks, shit, I'm going to be by myself, ends up going to somebody, having a backup plan. Whereas a woman with a healthy home, what happens when that happens, she doesn't like it, she'll communicate it more often. And if she has to leave, she'll leave. But the woman with the fear of abandonment and fear of being alone doesn't want to be by herself again. So she needs to have that love from two people. She'll get it from somebody else. And that usually is what I find. When I, when a man asks me, tells me about his wife cheating, it's the first question I ask. It's a sad reality, though. It's a shame. Because I, I don't want to in any way judge it. But when you've had no father figure at all, it puts a lot of pre- it's, Women need to be loved. They need men. And so when they find a husband... He becomes the only man in her life. And when he's abandoning her, she thinks, shit, what do I do? Whereas when you have your father figure, it's like my, my boyfriend's being annoying and your dad will say, oh, you know, don't worry about it. You know, you've got that, you know, when you're comforting your kids, they come to you with so much. And then your dad gives you that financial security if you need it. And he gives you that emotional security. If you need it. He gives you that buffer. Now, without that, it's very hard for women when they start feeling like a bit abandoned. I'm not blaming anybody, but that's usually what I find is some kind of childhood trauma. So, so that then goes back to choosing the right partner in the first place, doesn't it? And I, making sure you're with the right person. So making sure that person's healed or understands their kind of insecurities rather than um, reincarnates them. But I don't know. I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, who's cheated? <laughs> everybody. <laughs> if you're in Dubai, everybody. But talk to me about that. Is that do you think that's more common here in Dubai? Absolutely. Than it, really? Absolutely. Uh, and I always say that because here's the, the reality, rich men are far more likely to be cheated on. They think they're not. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> say that slowly. Rich men are far more likely to be cheated on. Far more likely to be cheated on. Why are rich men far more likely to be cheated on? Usually their wives don't work. When your wife doesn't work, it gives her the luxury of time, energy, effort, all of those things. So usually she doesn't work. They usually have nannies. So she's not this drained, you know, in England, it's totally different. When you are a housewife in England, you're still in your pajamas all day. Um, but here you've got the luxury of maids, all this stuff. So you've got the luxury to, of being social. And the other thing is usually with rich men, they're busy. They're super, super busy. So it gives their wife a lot of idle time, a lot of idle time. And she's in circles where there's lots of eligible bachelors or lots of desirable men. Now, if you're dating a guy that, you know, is, and this is no offense, but say, for example, just a casual nine to five, his friends are usually a casual nine to five kind of guy. It's not this, oh, look at that guy. Oh, he knows this guy. None of that. It's just, that's John, that's James, that's it. It's quite casual. But with a rich man, he introduces this woman to a lifestyle and to a network that she can't access without him. And then that coupled with spare time and money means idle Idle minds are the devil's workshop. So boredom leads to infidelity. Well, yeah, because it's rich men are also, um, what happens is they don't realize they're not spending as much time together. So do rich men typically cheat on their mates? They do. I mean, I think with men, it's more consistent across the social economic band. It's just that rich men can access more beautiful women if they wanted to. More gold diggers. So the women, the women are essentially shagging the personal trainer, yeah. and the rich men are shagging their secretary. Basically, is that unfortunately? Really? Yeah, unfortunately. Usually, the nannies have a side piece, and he's usually, you know, works for her partner. The nanny has a the nanny. No, no, the wife. Sorry. So the wife. Yeah, a side partner who's usually just like the children's swimming instructor or something like that. Isn't that awful? But this is a generalization. This is not everybody. But it's usually what I find. It's frequent. It's frequent. And Uh, also, unfortunately for rich men, they can't help but attract women that like lifestyle more than connection. Because a woman that really values connection, she doesn't like a busy, a rich man's lifestyle. A woman that really needs emotional connection, she finds being with a CEO or being with a really successful man is hard for her. She leaves because she wants emotional intimacy. So rich men are almost left with women that love lifestyle, who will compromise an emotional connection in order to get that financial investment. And so rich men are left with a pool of women who are not as connected to them. So more likely to cheat. If you're single here in Dubai, you're, I don't know, late 40s. Mm-hmm. You're attractive. Mm-hmm. Um, you're independent. Mm-hmm. 
Man or woman? A woman. A woman, yeah. What kind of man would go for you, considering that age? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I would say, I think men do come full circle. What happens is when they're young, they'll choose a compatible partner, like around the same age, same kind of um, social economic status, whatever. Then they might get money. Then they realize how annoying being married is. So they, you know, get usually get divorced. Then they just want to party and they want that 23-year-old Swedish model and they want to enjoy their life. But then they realize how vacuous that is when their back starts hurting and she could care less. And he's sick and she's nowhere to be found. And so then what happens is they get, they almost get re-traumatized and then recalibrate back to normal. And then they start seeking more emotional intimacy. And then they want a woman that's around the same age, who's not using them and will be there when, you know, they have a doctor's appointment. Because doctor's appointments get more frequent when a man gets older. So the guy who's 50 years old dates the 35-year-old or the 30-year-old because he's young and hot, etc. cetera, yeah? yeah. The, the guy that's 65 years old, he doesn't date the 50-year-old. He typically goes for companionship more. Is that what you're saying? Well, it doesn't matter about so much about his age. It's about what he's done in that past. Say if he's had enough of those models, influences that have used and abused him and left him when he's, you know, needed them. And he's seen them walk away with his best friend in a club enough times for him to then recalibrate. Because that's what they will do. Hmm. Yeah, those 23-year-old influencers that you think are going to be loyal to you they're on their table for free food and they will leave with the bouncer's number. Talk to me about narcissistic women. Oh, there's so many of them. You know? well, well, first of all, what is a narcissistic woman? Um, I would say narcissistic women. You, I would say there's more of a case of narcissistic mothers than there is just of women. And I think the, I think the process of becoming a mother, and I think this is something that's under not spoken about enough, is the process of becoming a mother creates narcissistic women because... It's so draining on the body. The, the things that they go through to have this baby, that when they finally birth it, they almost expect a loyal minion out of that child. And they use that child as a weapon. And so what happens is people who might be slightly selfish and entitled, when they become a mother, they become a narcissist because they see that child as an extension of them. It's their identity. And you see it a lot, even with the, you know, the rise of abortions. The fact that women see babies as a body part and they'll say things like my body, my choice, completely disregarding human life because they see it as a body part. So imagine that mentality going into mothering, that you're seeing a child like an organ, like, okay, if I want it, I keep it. If I don't want it, I don't keep it. Not seeing it as a separate human being that has a life and rights. I'm not saying there's anything wrong or right about abortion, but look at that mentality we're breeding in women, that it's your body, it's your choice. So what's a child then? Just a body part? So then when they become... Whoa, 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 I'm not having that. Yeah, well, that's the mentality we're creating. I don't, I don't agree with that. Why? Well, because you're, you're suggesting if somebody has sex with a man and they're pregnant within a short period of time, yeah. that they should birth that child. I'm suggesting that it's not a body part. So you can, you can lose that child, you can keep that child, but it should be a mutual decision between husband and wife or between the two parties because it's two people's baby. Just because it's brewed in your body doesn't make it yours. We are biologically pro programmed like this. I didn't volunteer to have a uterus. I didn't say, please let me spend nine months having this baby. We are programmed. So therefore, when if, if I have a baby with somebody, it's not just my choice to kill it or keep it. It's a bo it's a baby. It's not a body part. Yeah, but you're saying that you're saying that um, it takes two people. Women to... women talk to them about uh, uh, and and use them as organs. So uh, well, not... but talking well, saying my body, my choice. What is that implying about a baby? That implies that she has the right to decide to keep it or not. But then that implies that the baby is what a a child or a body part? A, an embryo, yeah. Well, it's a it's a child, and a child is two people's. And the, the idea of me saying my body, my choice suggests it's my when really two people make you and you and I, you and I, I don't know, we're dating. Yeah. Okay, we're both single people. We're mm. dating. We get intimate after a while and hey diddly dee by mistake something mm. went wrong and you're pregnant yeah okay so what what should happen we should have a discussion and get to a mutual so let's agreement. say you yeah, say you say you know what i've never had a baby i've always wanted a baby it's my dream mm -hmm. and i'm like i've never had a baby i've never wanted a baby it's my nightmare i would say whoever if there's we even one person saying no side towards the no because it leads to resentment and the child is then birthed with the conflict 
But I do think it should be two people's choice. It shouldn't be my body, my choice. That slogan is disgraceful and disturbing. Well, it's, it's my great. body, my choice, your money. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, though, isn't it? Because it, because it, because if a woman gets pregnant and she decides that she wants to have the baby, yeah. that the, the man, regardless, so if it's has to pay you, for it. Regardless, I have to pay for it for the next eighteen years. Go to jail if you don't. And so many women have had put the wrong man's name on the birth certificate, and even sent men to jail for not paying it when he wasn't the father. Okay, well that's a separate issue. Separate issue. Yeah, yeah but for a minute. Yeah. So so basically, my body, my choice, your money. Disgraceful. Now tell me if that's not breeding a generation of narcissistic women. We're creating them. Society is conditioning women to become as narcissistic as possible through the use of social media, through the use of abortion laws, through the slogans like women in power. Everything is creating narcissism in women these days, but nothing more visceral than the abortion debate. Okay, let's take some other examples around this because it, it, it's important for me to understand. You know, I'm 52, you're 30 years old, I'm a generation ahead of you, yeah. so I come from a, a different time. Just a bit, yeah. all right, cheeky. No, 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 I actually think we're more alike than I would be with a 21-year-old. Okay. Yeah, because we didn't grow up with memes and social media and TikTok. I think we would have far more in common than me with the average 18, 20 year old. You'd be lucky to get an 18. Yeah. Oh, honey, don't put it past me. <laughs> so, so I've got a girlfriend, let's say, let's say you're my girlfriend. Okay, yeah. okay let's just use these as yeah. the examples. Okay, you're my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. We've both got social media. On your social media, um, there's pictures of me and you at the beach. Yep. Okay, in our swimming costumes, yep. there's pictures of you at the beach and you your swimming costume. There's mm -hmm. you at uh, uh, um, at a party with a short skirt yeah. and, a, and yeah, a bit of cleavage showing. Mm -hmm. um, you posted that on social media as well. So there's a bit of that. Um, I don't really think much about it because I think you're hot and sexy. And so I don't really think much about it. Are, are you doing anything to disrespect our relationship? Um, the reality is you might be posting with zero intentions to do anything disrespectful, but the response in other men is disrespectful. Whether we like it or not, the response you're going to get from other men is disrespectful. Now, I could have zero intentions of ever cheating or disrespecting my partner. But the reality is, if I'm posting a bikini pic, I know what it would look like. It, my DMs would be filled with men. Now, all it takes is that, this is why we're creating narcissism. When a woman posts a picture of a bikini and then sees her DMs like covered with men, then the next time her boyfriend's not on his best behavior, she can use that as a weapon. She can automatically post a picture, get a replacement, and go for dinner that night with somebody new. Now, tell me we're not creating narcissistic women if this is the setup that social media is providing women. It's providing women with the idea that men are disposable and they are easily lured. And for men, they, I mean, they do it as well with their liking and sending, but it's not as easy as it is for women. Well, if I was to post a picture of me in my swimming, swimming costume, I know I'd have a few a few likes and a few comments, but maybe they wouldn't be the kind maybe of Maybe they won't fly you out to the Barbados. <laughs> yeah, <they're right. laughs> yeah. but, you know, they, they'd they'd probably go my mum and my grand well. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe yeah, Chelsea Bent. Too, but... exactly, exactly. And it's a completely different ball game. So what social media is doing, what this woke culture is doing is destroying femininity and replacing it with narcissism and telling them that's feminism. So, if a girl is posting pictures of her on Instagram, let's say, mm -hmm. in her swimming costume and a bikini, mm -hmm. and she's in a relationship, then she's di indirectly disrespecting her partner because other men see that content and want to pursue what they see on that image. It's totally unconscious in a lot of cases. But the reality is we don't live in a perfect world. If it was a perfect world, women could walk around wearing whatever they want and men would act no different if she was covered. But it's just not life. I used to be a teacher and I, and you know, when I used to wear dresses and stuff like that to work. And I used to sometimes get called in to be like, oh, the boys are getting a little bit, you know, can you... And I used to get a little bit like, oh, what, 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 what? the boys are getting a little bit distracted. Can you like, you know, maybe not wear heels or not wear this? And I used to get caught in quite a bit. And um, I know, it's, but I used to what get... What, teenage boys used to get distracted when you were Obviously, they're not blind. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. yeah, and then I, at the time, I used to get a bit like, oh, this is not nice. How come so-and-so gets to wear whatever she wants? And, and I'd be pointing to like a 50-year-old woman and be like, she gets to wear whatever she wants. But the reality is... 
life's not fair. And then I had to realize that, well, Sally, come on, grow up. Life's not fair. The reality is a teenage boy is, I was like 22 when I started teaching, 21 years old. So, you know, you just got to play the game. It's the, rea the real world is you can't do whatever you want, whenever you want and expect no repercussions. It's just not life. Now, the reality is I can post whatever I want, do whatever I want. And a lot of times it is innocent. I see so many women who, with their children on the beach posting a picture. It's got no, they've got no bad intentions. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that men see bikinis as no different to lingerie. They get to see your body naked. Okay, so let me let me let me take another site another example. You and I are in a relationship. We're yes. dating six months, oh. um, and on my social media, I follow other women that dress like that or post pictures like mm -hmm. that. How, is that disrespectful? Is that irrelevant? Does it matter? I think it is. Uh, it depends on the boundaries of your relationship. I just think that some women have zero concern about that, and I think pick a partner like that if you want to be that guy that has that autonomy pick a partner that allows that and doesn't mind it but a lot of women and I actually think this is the rise of why surgery is so high in this day and age women are seeing what men are following on Instagram and then changing their bodies and appearance to match that and that's why women are now starting to look the same the, uh, the amount of young girls that come to me and say he keeps following girls with you know with lip fillers and so now I'm getting my lips done he keeps following girls with like a, a bum implant so now I'm getting so it's the reason why women are getting more and more insecure is because they can literally see what my boyfriend's type, what it would be if I didn't exist. They're getting a version of that. And it's not a good reminder for yourself. I look at young women now and all I see from young women is this whole kind of like massive lips. Mm -hmm. Okay. That look ridiculously big for their face. Um, obviously fake boobs. They yep. still seem to have those. Um, but they do and, a lot of bum implants now as well. Yeah, yeah. and this whole thing with bums. Yeah. Now, I, I've, I've, maybe I'm old, but I don't get this bum thing. Yeah. Why, why, why do women feel that they need to have bums that you can put a cup of tea on? <laughs> um, that's what men are rewarding in society at this moment. Do men really like that? Uh, well, young men, yeah, because pornography. Pornography dictates males' desires. So if you look at what men are into, it's very much dictated by the content they find in pornography. Pornography tells you what you like. You don't tell pornography. Pornography will put something out there, make it common, and then people will be like, yeah, I actually quite like the idea of sleeping with my stepsister. Where'd you get that from? Most, most people have watched pornography. Yeah. I haven't, though. Are you proud of me? So I remember the first time I saw pornography, yeah. I think I was about, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 years old. Um, I uh, was super young in your generation. I was at a friend's house. We were playing computer games up in his loft, and his dad had this chest in the corner. Mm -hmm. And in this chest in the corner were these mags, penthouse magazines, oh. Playboy magazines. Really? And we looked at them and were like, oh, okay, shut the lid, you know, terrified that our fingerprints might be on them. And then we <laughs> ran away, never to be seen again. And then some years later, I was working on a building site in my summer holidays, and there were some, some, some pornographic magazines that were in the cafeteria for the builders. Um, and, and I saw them as well. And so that was my first exposure. And then th thereafter, I, I, I did, at my age, I didn't get a chance to see videos because you had to go to the video shop and hire a video. Here's but, I, but hold on, yeah. hold on. But nowadays, everybody has access to it, reg regardless. Everybody has access to it on their device anytime they want to have. What kind of damage... I can't believe I've just told of that information. Yeah, my you pervy child. <laughs> <laughs> my mum, my mum won't forgive me. Um, mum, by the way, it was at Auntie Jackie's. <laughs> my mum listens to every podcast. I was at Auntie Jackie's. It was bows in his chest. Russell showed it to me. Anyway, now you've got that out of the way. Amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Auntie really Jackie, it was that. like, yeah. I love you, mum. <laughs> but I, I remember, uh, I, I believe that, that. If you're in a relationship or if you're single, that there's a place for people that 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 enjoy that kind of stuff. It shouldn't be kind of like it's bad for everybody. Okay. Or do you believe differently? I believe differently because I just think, look at what you described there. Look at the amount of shame and guilt attached to just looking at pornography, looking at another woman. The shame and guilt that you might feel like asking for a magazine on the top shelf. Men knew there was something seedy about that. What's happening now is we've removed that shame and guilt attached to sexual pleasures. So what's happening is pleasures have no cap. There's no shame. There's no guilt. Now, absolutely, I understand that there might be an element of it. But here's how pleasure works. It takes more of it to create the same level of dopamine. 
Now, if we're starting at 10 years old, children are getting uh, watching porn, as they age, it's going to take more and more and more and more. And there's never... What do you mean more and more? More, more, more... More, it's going to take... Like more extreme no- stuff. For more novelty. More novelty, okay. And novelty, this is where we get child tra- trafficking and pornography. People don't start with child pornography. They start with just normal stuff. Then they go on to like bisexual stuff. Then they go to transgender stuff. And then it works slowly. The devil is patient. The devil is patient. He'll start with normal, normal desires and they get more and more insidious. Before you know it, you get to a place you don't recognize. Now, there's never been a serial killer on death row that hasn't been addicted to pornography. Can you believe that? What? They did. And this was in, they did this study. Say that again. There's never been a serial killer on death row that was not addicted to pornography. And this was in the 90s. They did this study. So imagine in the 90s, people on death row were addicted to pornography when it was difficult to find VHS, headphones, like how did, there was no such thing. So imagine in this day and age where being addicted to pornography is a norm. Imagine the impacts of we're creating narcissistic women, uh, as we talked about in society, and psychopathic men. And marriages, so many marriages fall apart because men are unable to get an uh, erection from their wife. Imagine watching all sorts of porn and then going to your normal wife who breastfeeds your children and expecting to have an, a physical connection. It won't work. So the damage caused by porn outweighs any any positives. I don't believe there are any positives, but if they were, the damage is far, far more ubiquitous than the, any kind of, any benefit. Wow. I never... Um... Yeah. Never, Ted, never, Bundy, never... Ted Bundy does a really great breakdown on this and Ted Bundy's fantastic case study because he didn't have a particularly traumatic childhood and as a psychologist the first thing you look at is their childhood you're like okay you know th- this I'll go to and he had two loving parents and he did a really great interview and he said that I came from a healthy home everything was okay but I'm not saying it was pornography but pornography introduced me into a world I didn't know was humanly capable so then I wanted to test my human desires. It's a great interview because he's so articulate with it. Mm. Mm. Okay, some other questions for you on this particular subject mm-hmm. then. Open relationships mm-hmm. and cheating. What are the boundaries in that? Um, I would. Uh, I have to preface this with saying I don't have much experience in working with people with open relationships and I don't have as much experience. In my, in my small amount of experience of what I've seen, is um, open relationships a bit like, you know, when people used to have two wives and stuff like that. It sounds good on paper, but it works only when you're not emotionally attached. So in cultures where they have two wives, four wives, like we see in Dubai, um, marriage is a duty. It's a coming together of two families and creating a home. So people can work well with that. Now, when we've got this romanticized idea in the Western world where you have to be madly in love and connected to your husband and wife, when you see an element of that being taken to somebody else, it's a matter of time where you just either start to want that person a partner back or you're just, why am I here? If I don't love you enough to have that connection, why am I here? So it doesn't work in the same capacity, I would imagine. What would you think? Mm. The, the thought of after being married once and married again, the thought of having... Two mother-in-laws. Two wives. <laughs> Short of having two wives or three or even four wives to me. It's just like, it sounds, it just sounds, it, it sounds really draining to me. But you know, the, I mean, uh, and again, this is my lack of experience. So, um, you know, in the process of women, when they have kids and they get busy, can you understand why there's two wives in those kind of environments? I think that when people have two kids and they get busy, that that means that you need to do work with your wife and Mm. understanding that the kids, although they're the priority in terms of responsibility and caring, Mm. um, they got married. Yeah. Um, And there needs to be work done on trying to remember that the the husband should be treated like the husband. Yeah. Yeah. but I, you know, I've experienced it myself where the kids came first. Experience, because I experience this a lot with men when the uh, first time fathers are the most likely to be unfaithful. And uh, a lot of studies have found this and they, they try and put it down to a woman's low sex drive and this, that, but it's actually the lack of attention they receive in their own home. They come home from a busy day of work and she's not looking at them anymore. She doesn't greet them. She's busy with the, and it's no, this is no disrespect for her because the job is really tiring, but he starts to feel like a stranger in his own home. She's just prioritizing everything and everything over him, and he's working and coming back and seeing nothing. No, but then what no happens? For him. That person then cheats. Mm. The guy then cheats. The guy then cheats and finds something 
my either, either more exciting, more new, more more, more attention. 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 Um, that happens then, which, which leads then to the downfall of the relationship. And then it's another trauma of being by yourself again, and then realizing the girl that you were cheating with wasn't that great. It's just that you needed a bit of attention. And so I think it, remaining connected is the antidote to all of this trauma. Okay. Now, um, how does it work differently here with the mentality of, of, of Emirati or Middle Eastern women compared to women back in the West? Do you see a, a, a difference in behavior, understanding, interpretations, or is it all the same? I would say I think it used to be really, really different. I used, I think the women used to have this mentality that they're a bit more financially entitled, like my partner pays for everything and sorts everything out, but then I will look after him in terms of cooking and cleaning and stuff. What's happening now with the rise of social media, it's giving everybody kind of globalized norms and values. And the entitlement of women is starting to creep into cultures where women are still expecting that financial investment without giving any of that domestic duty. With that, so what's happening in Western women is that they're now seeing that they, I want a lifestyle, I want to be flown out, I want a bag, but none of them are thinking, I'm going to make my husband a cup of tea when he comes home, I'm going to cook dinner, I'm going to make sure his clothes are ironed. Again, the narcissism is creeping in. Okay, so this is one you know, I hear. I hear a lot about you know, guys that say to me, or I hear people say that guys want to have a traditional wife, um, um, a, a partner that um, that that stays home, doesn't have a career. I don't believe that. that. Kind of okay, um, let me finish what I'm saying. Um, one of the sexiest things I think that exists for me in women is their career. Yeah. Okay. I find it really sexy to see a woman who's driven and focused and passionate and and career minded. I, I, I think that's really sexy. One of the ugliest things I see in women is them expecting men to pay. Yeah. I find it ugly for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. Number one, okay, I understand it if you've got three kids and you're busy being a homemaker. Yeah, yeah. Husband is the breadwinner. And treat that. him well. But if there's two of you together, you're a team. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you're a team... You both contribute. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean that we go fifty fifty at Pizza Hut tonight or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> but it, it means we work as a team. Yeah. You know, um, uh, give me money, buy me clothes, buy me handbags, pay for my lifestyle, pay for my life while I sit and, and enjoy do nothing. Myself. Yeah. Okay. You go out and work, and you, and you you owe it to me because you need to be a man. Yeah, it's, it's a dangerous mentality to okay. still. I think that's disgusting and I don't get it. And there'll be lots of lots of people that listen to this mm. and women out there that come from a mindset, okay, where the man should pay. You know, uh, what was his name? Um, uh, 50 Cent. They said to 50 Cent, uh, who, we should pays, go on a who date. pays on a first date? Yeah. He said, whoever whoever asks. Yeah. Now, I don't believe for one minute you go on a first date and you go Dutch. Of course, I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not a Neanderthal. Yeah. Okay, I don't believe that at all. But, being in a relationship with someone where they expect you to pay for everything, period. Yeah. Even though they have a job, a career, and all that kind of stuff. To me, it's like... Well, it's narcissism. Well, here's the thing. In Dubai, I would say the number one cause of divorce is that it's that woman that sits at home scrolling through her phone all day while nanny's raising... Oh, please, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was telling Spencer that while you're fasting, if somebody eats in front of you and you're patient, you get more reward from God. So go ahead. And it opens. So yeah, I was saying in Dubai... What happened? You're just giving away that it's been in Ramadan. I know. It, oh, it's not going to be released. And we, we cut that out. Yeah, we'll <laughs> cut that. Um, but it, what happens in Dubai is that women are incredibly, incredibly um, entitled in the sense that they have nannies looking after the kids. They have a maid cleaning up and they have a cook cleaning. That's cook cleaning? Sorry, cook, uh, cook cooking. And they won't even get their partner a glass of water, but expect everything paid for them. And then he he becomes so unbelievably unattracted to her. He can't even physically find himself attracted to her. And they always come to me and say, we've got no sex life. We've got no sex life. Why have we got no sex life? He, he doesn't desire me or anything like that. And they're thinking it's something in their intimacy. And I say it's because... He, you do nothing to, sh you don't court him in any way. He has no respect for you. He doesn't respect, and you don't, you don't respect yourself, surely, if you're all day, every day, just doing nothing while the kids are being raised by somebody else, the food is being cooked by somebody else, you're doing nothing. How do you expect him to be physically attracted to you? There's no emotional intimacy. See, so they don't even ask their partner, how was your day, what was going on, because, and the partner doesn't even tell them because they think she won't understand. She doesn't know what it's like to close a deal. 
She doesn't know what it's like to meet with investors. Why well, am I going to tell a housewife what it's like when uh, you're, uh, you've are you just invested in the wrong place and you have, well, you're waiting for your return on investment is taking longer? She's not going to get it. So they end up just saying, how are the kids? And then expecting, and she's confused why he's not physically attracted to her at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. He's not going to be attracted to you. So as much as I don't think men want a housewife or anything like that, but they do want to be pampered a little bit. They do want somebody to say, have you eaten? Do you want food? Do you want this? Like, I got your coffee. They do like that pampering, just like women do like when a man buys them stuff and invests in them financially. But there's no res- there's no intellectual intimacy with a woman who sat at home doing yeah, nothing. It's a term you just used, invests in them financially. Yeah. You just said buys them stuff and invests in them financially. That's the same shit. But here's the thing. Buys them stuff. Whether we like it or not, women are attracted to men who are able to look after them. Well, Marilyn Monroe says, okay, um, a rich man is as valuable as a pretty woman. Exactly. It's not essential, but it helps. It sure does help, is what she says, yeah. So my value comes, so I'm more attractive because I'm wealthy and you're more attractive because you're pretty. Yeah. What are you then if you're pretty and wealthy? Oh, you're a Saudi account. Oh, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Can we cut that out? <laughs> so not cutting that out. <laughs> um, well, if you're pretty and wealthy, then you shoot yourself in the foot. Because here's what I say. When you're a woman who's financially independent, this is what happens. Men don't invest in you at all. They don't financially do anything for you because they think she's strong. And when you don't ask for anything as well. There are women out there that are financially independent and they don't ask for anything. But we still feel loved when a man looks after us. Just like a man can cook, but he feels loved when a woman's prepared a hot meal for him. He feels loved when he comes home from it with that. Even though you can get it himself and you can warm it up himself or all the it's Nice, you took the time to cook me dinner and put it on the table and for us to eat together. And then I'll have a conversation with you. Yeah, 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 of course. Similarly, women who are financially independent... They uh, feel loved when a man says, oh, I've just um, I, I've just paid your road tax and I've just fixed your car for you. Or, oh, uh, the rent is done. Uh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. We feel loved when we're invested in it. It's biological. It's evolutionary. My wife so, loves it when I get Cafu to fill her car up. Yeah, we love it's that like, shit. He's like, thank you so much. <laughs> he said, I don't have to go and get my, my money. Here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with a woman wanting financial investment. It's who you're giving that to. What's happening is men are investing in the wrong women. They're investing in that lazy, bum, entitled woman who's housewife and then saying, oh, she's, you, she just wants me for my money. But if you choose, but when they're with a successful woman, they end up not investing in her and then she ends up feeling a bit resentful. But if you choose a good, successful woman who's wholesome and adds value and invest in her, there's, that investment will double. But if you invest in, a, in a, a useless, entitled woman, there's no return on that investment. Whenever I see a couple that look to me like a team yeah like genuinely look to me like beautiful right i don't mean they're both you know they're both the hottest people on the planet yeah. beautiful kids but they just look like a team yeah. you know they talk about their business enthusiastically they talk about life enthusiastically they just they just look like they fit yeah okay that to me is like the best picture you can well, see. here's the thing what makes a successful couple is not 50 50 or this certainly other. it's both people giving their 100 percent Mm-hmm. And if she's giving a hundred percent, whether it's like looking after him, looking after the home, making sure his life is easy, and he's giving a hundred percent financially, or they're both giving their hundred percent, both home and financially, when both people are extending themselves and putting in their full effort, is when it lasts. It's not really about you do cooking, you do that. It's more about are we both giving exactly everything we have to offer to this partner? Okay. Can you give advice for someone who's in a traumatic, toxic, or toxic relationship? Um, it happens a lot. What happens is with uh, toxic relationships, they give you love in doses. So they'll be nice to you, great to you, and followed by a lot of torture. Nice, torture. And then what happens is we get addicted to that nice and we remember the nice and we, we hold on to that nice moment because we know it's coming. It's going to come in. Just hang in there. Hang in through the to- toxic torture and it will come. But when you have to say to, to yourself, he's got potential to be good. Remember when he used to be nice. Remember when she was kind. She wasn't always like this. When you have to say those conversations to yourselves, you are lying to yourself. Because when you're saying, remember when she used to be good, remember when he used to be nice, that is really, remember when he wasn't showing you his true colors. So stop holding on to the remember when and replace it with current situation is bringing out the worst in him and me. Let's let's let it go. Sadia. Yeah, Spencer. You told me you were 30 years old earlier. 
Well, a bit older than that. But would you say? Would you say you were thirty-three? Thirty-three. Mm-hmm. Thirty-three years old. You're single. Yeah. You're pretty. Yeah. You have a career. Yeah. I've got to know you've got a really warm personality. You're yeah. fun to be around. You've nice energy to you. Yeah. Why are you single? I'm not actually single. Oh, uh, something's <laughs> changed recently. No, something's resurfaced recently. Yeah, okay. but yeah, I'm not actually single. Um, but I do struggle in terms of like, um, you know, situations, and you I do. Told struggle. me something really profound when I listened to you when we were chatting that night. You told me something really profound about say? about why you struggle with relationships. What did I say? Well, can you remember? I'm going to allow you to say it. Based around the trauma that you have with yeah. relationships and the trauma that you have with what you need mm. from somebody. Do you, I can't remember what I said. Can you remind me? So you were talking about um, how you're not actually good for people mm. in the state that, well, you were saying this that night. Did I say that? I'm, yeah. so, I'm so profound. Yeah. What did I, what did I say? <laughs> so did my, <laughs> you said, I'm a top shagger. No, no, no. Yeah, but you isn't that probably needs to be cut. Yeah, yeah. no worries. You but that. You, you said that, that words along the lines of you, you don't make people feel uh, a partner feel what he needs to feel at the moment because of the issues that you have. Yeah, can you elaborate on that for me? So if I'm feeling anxious and if I'm feeling stressed and if I'm feeling unloved, I will ensure in that moment my partner feels the same emotion. And I, even if I have to lie to get there, even if I have to... You and I, in a relationship, six months in, you're not feeling... You're uh, feeling unloved. I'm feeling unloved. Okay, you're feeling anxious. Yeah. And then you will do your jealous. best. To, and you're feeling jealous. You would, you you have and do have... So this person might listen to this episode. You, you. Let's say you. you yeah, yeah. You will then make me... Feel the same way. And no matter... you And you'll, you'll concoct a plan consciously or subconsciously? Um... I would say it's always on a conscious level. It's always on a conscious level. So this is it's something that I've worked on now, but for a long time, this is what I would do. Say, for example, if I'm feeling anxious, jealous, insecure, I'm going to make sure you feel anxious, jealous, and insecure. Whether that means, like, I don't know, uh, saying mean things, or if it means, you know, uh, not returning calls, or whatever, it means making sure you feel the same way. Now, when you told me that, when we when we sat on that evening talking, that was really unusual to me. But that you, level you, of self awareness, or that no, 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 the thing? fact that, you, that that happens and you do that, I felt I really, felt really sad for you. Aww. Okay, I, I felt some pain there. But yeah. now I listen to you say it right now, I'm like, that's not that uncommon. Everyone does it. I think everyone does it when we're feeling in a great mood. It's contagious. When you're in a good mood, you make sure, I mean, like, you know, that guy that skips into the office and is like, hey guys, and tries to make everyone feel the same way. And you know, that moody person that comes into the office is miserable and tries to make everyone feel the same way. I'm very good at not doing it in my real life, but I am very apt at making sure I do it in, in vulnerable relationships. That fascinates me. That does. Are you getting better? Mm. Yeah, really. The medication's helping. <laughs> 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 Talk to me about um, your ideal client. So who would you like to, you know, from the audience here, the people that might be listening to you think, oh, my, she might be able to help me. Who who do you typically help? Do you know what I would say? It's not that necessarily it's my ideal, but what my forte happens to be because of where I live and the environment that I'm in, it is that hyper successful um, man who might be either single or going through a divorce or like in relationships, whatever it is. But that hyper successful man, I can almost navigate him very well. Because I know the type of women he attracts, I know the type of problems he'll have, I know the emotional disconnect because overworking is a coping mechanism. So to become a hyper successful man, you have to foster skills that are not transferable to a relationship. And that's why he's so hyper successful. So it's usually a coping mechanism. It's usually a way of, you know, tuning out what's really going on in the real world. It's an addiction. It's no different to alcohol, but it's just one that society promotes. And so I kind of see through the facade a bit with that hyper successful man. And then we can break that down and get him connected to his true self. Okay. So that for all of you that are listening, watching out there, that's the kind of person that she helps. And so if you're that kind and of dates. person, then reach. And dates. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, lastly, before we finish, okay, yeah. have you enjoyed being on the podcast? I've loved it. You know what's so funny? Before we got here, we're like, oh, like winging it almost. But now, wasn't it great? 
Well, I put a lot of time and effort into no, you it. Didn't, you didn't know who I was. I came in and he was like, you are. <laughs> I, said to the, I said to the guys on the team and, and they'll be able to vouch for it. I met this girl the other night. Okay. Yeah, and, and she needs to come on the podcast. Blew me away. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. Yeah, you said it. In a she moment. was great. <laughs> I'm really charming in person, aren't I? Much better in person than you are because when you watch your videos and your content on social, you're stern, you're serious, you're 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 you're, you're, a, you're a bundle of fun. Yeah, but you would never know that on social media. Like no. I'm so fun in real life, but on social media, I'm like three reasons why your wife's gonna leave you, and it's like very negative. <laughs> <laughs> three reasons why I like you know and it's just very stern and so people take me really wrong but if you know me in person the thing is the psychology stuff is two percent of my personality if you know me in person it's just a completely different energy but then I happen to have the psychology stuff so online it's a completely different version so I'm glad we met on a non-podcast version for, uh, like environment first and then we got to do the podcast mm, for sure, uh, for sure. is it harder to take me serious when you know me in person I think it's um, uh, when you when you don't know someone, you have to try. I mean, I've interviewed 250 people. So when you don't know someone, you have to try and connect with them. So you consume a lot of content. I think I saw your content. I thought I need to have her on, on the show. I then met you. Yeah. Um, and look, the, the, the bottom line is you're a sweetheart. You, I really am. You're really, <laughs> you're, you're lovely and you're friendly and yeah. you're vulnerable. And I like that about yeah. you as well. Yeah. So it's just a joy to be around. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. It's we have to do it. this again. Thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> thank you.